Welcome back to Talking Fire. It's Hilton Turner and Clive, Clive Ford. Ford. Yeah. As usual on our white couches. Just touching on some issues with regards to gas suppression and more on the detection side for now. Yep. Um, and how the systems go together, the cause and effect settings, what is the requirement. Um, Clive, I'm going to pass over to you with regards to the first thing, which is double knock coincidence. How do we clarify them? What does each term mean and how do they differ from each other? All right. So the easiest is to refer back to the standard. And um, we had a discussion about this a couple of days ago and there was a lot of consternation. So best is go back to the standards. And in the beginning of 101.39, uh, I think it's under definitions clause 3.9, it states that a double knock is generally seen as a confirmed fire. So it's two fire conditions from one device. Um, this is the way it's quoted in the standard. Um, we don't always agree with that. But if you're looking at a suppression system, you need a coincidence. And a coincidence is two separate fire alarms from two separate devices. So for instance, if you're using a aspirating system, you could have a fire one and a fire two. You could use, see that as two alarms. However, it's coming from one device. That is not coincidence. You, or you should not use that as a first knock, second knock for a fire detection would that, suppression. Sorry to interrupt, would that yeah, yeah. constitute a double knock? That would be seen as a double knock. Okay. Um, the other scenario is that quite a lot of the fire panels and especially on addressable it can be set up as a um, confirmed fire which would be seen the same as a double knock so you've got one device it would go into fire condition if it's been set up as a confirmed device uh, fire you've got a certain time period so if it goes gives you a fire alarm it would almost put it into a, a memory and if within a, the next five minutes ten minutes whatever you get another alarm it would see that as a Coincident, uh, uh, see, I'm already getting confused. Confirmed fire or double knock. Coincidence is two separate alarms from two separate items. Okay. So you can use aspirating, sorry. Uh, but then you're going to have to have two devices. You're going to have to have two aspirating systems, both of them giving you a fire condition to give you your coincidence. Okay, so now, as, as, as we're falling under suppression. Yeah. Okay, and now this is obviously, once again, it's quite a generalization, but... Traditionally, we use a three-zone combination panel or, you know, um, multiple-zone combination yeah, yeah. panel, however. And we require a detector of zone one and a detector of zone two. Yep. Each to go into alarm. So when what go one goes, we get a sound of beacon active. Yeah. Uh -huh. When second knock comes, we get a sound of beacon, changes tone. Yeah. Fire bell comes yeah. into account and it initiates. Correct. Am I correct in stating that that would then fall under... A coincidence alarm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In the old days, um, which you don't get anymore, but you used to be able to get an addressable fire uh, gas control unit. Okay. And that's where a lot of confusion came in. So you would have um, one fire loop going through a gas area, a gas suppression okay. area or a suppression area. Uh, and you would have two devices being programmed on the addressable line and then triggering your addressable fire detection system. However, you don't have that anymore. So in general, 99.9% .9 of the time, you're going to have a, a gas extinguishing control panel and you've got to have two separate inputs going into that to initiate your gas discharge. Okay. Obviously, so, unless it's non-manual. So, yeah. so currently, the systems we see that are traditionally being used, yeah. although referred to as a double knock, it's, it's kind of more of a, the terminology yeah. state as opposed to the functionality. Okay, moving forward, obviously yeah. a lot of, um, and we've seen a, a massive influx of data centers being built in South Africa. Yes. Um, you know, um, from very high level players, American companies and stuff like that. So certain aspects to mm. take into account. Um, yeah. The first thing is obviously Computer equipment needs to stay below a certain temperature, and they've got a lot of crack units, a lot of high velocity airflow, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Will a point detector work? And what should the contractor take into account, or more so the designer should take into account? Because there are limitations on a point type detector in terms of maximum airflow. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, from your opinion, what what 
questions should be asked, what should be put in place in order to ensure that the airflow is not going to affect, should there be smoke, that the airflow is not going to prevent the system going into alarm. All right, so this is quite a detailed and quite a, um, a lot of design work needs to go into this. And we, in general, we would be looking at server rooms or data um, storage areas. And we're not looking at your little server room in your office where you've got a IBM device and uh, you're looking at that kind of thing. We're looking at proper big server rooms. Um, you need to look at the airflows. A lot of the terminology is hot hours, cold hours to get the right circulation through the areas. Um, you've got to look at the velocity that your point detector is designed for. Yes. If you look at the specs on the detector, it says it's going to work within these air velocities. If you've got a high airflow through there, your smoke is not going to get into the device and stay there long enough to initiate a fire condition. Then you're going to start moving across to ASDs and that kind of thing to maybe shut down the air conditioning so that your point detection has got time to react to the fire. However, then you've got to keep in mind overheating of the equipment. So if there's a fire outside the building in a, a, a field next door and that smoke does penetrate into the room, you've got to be aware of that kind of thing. Okay. So just, just touching, you mentioned hot and cold owls. Yeah. So just to, just to elaborate um, a bit more on that. Data centers, mm -hmm. they, they build racks, That's as we right. say. Um, temperature critical in terms of operating. Yep. Um, we've seen with uh, one of the major telecoms, there was actually a system designed that on first smoke level, they would only shut the HVAC down for a very short period of time to prevent overall failure. Should that smoke level not increase, they will then bring the HVAC back. So that's yep. the importance of it. So how it generally works is we've got the floor void mm -hmm. and above the rack we've got the ceiling void. The cold air comes through the bottom, hot air rises and escapes out the top. Yep. Those are two very... So now we need to take into account the density of cold air is yep. substantially more than the density of hot air. Yes. Um, so these are all the factors. So what we do in the bottom, so to do a using an ASD mm. to try and do a cold story, to do a cold owl and a hot owl, you will genuinely potentially get flow issues based on the, tens the density of the smoke. Yes. So these are all the things that need to be taken into account. And when designing these systems and when getting involved with these systems, we just need to ask these questions. Correct. What is the maximum airflow? Are there hot or cold owls? Are we shutting down the air conditioner? If we are, for how long? and these kind of things. But just keep in mind that a standard detector is that smoke is not going to remain in that chamber long enough no. to set off a fire condition should the airflow be probably 6.5 meters mm. a second and above. Yeah. I would say five, I would generally move towards an aspirating smoke detection system. And that's where it's very, diff very important to speak to the whole team. Uh, team, the, the IT people, the ventilation people, the uh, air conditioning people, all of those people need to be involved because if you shut down and the, the system overheats is going to fail, they're going to go into shutdown, millions of rands worth of um, data can get lost. So you can't just go, let's just slap in three detectors and it's good. You've got to, The design is very important on this. Yeah. So as we say, data centers are increasing. Generally, they are very high value areas. Yep. Um, the fire detection system controls a very high value of suppression system in the larger areas. Yeah, yeah. Um, the mm. suppression systems, um, they've started integrating certain types of waters and all kinds of different solutions have been brought in, all controlled by the fire detection system. So all the questions, the stuff that we briefly touched on, if you have any questions, please reach out. We'll give you as much information as we can. We have quite a few of the members that are very, very um, active in that sector that can assist to prevent false mm. alarms. And I think as much as a false alarm is an issue, a detector not going into alarm, in my mind, is a bigger issue. Correct, yeah. So just, you know, once again, in order to, <clears throat> in order to help them, well, educate the industry, to better the industry, please reach out. Um, any challenges, we are more than happy to help at any stage. Mm.